Stwierdza się, zbliża już, nie? Good afternoon, distinguished guests, dear colleagues and students. I am pleased to welcome you all to the seminar of the Faculty of Civil and Transport Engineering and the Poznan University of Technology. Our lecturer today is an outstanding scientist and civil engineer, Professor Herbert Mank from the Vienna University of Technology. So let me now uh, express my deep appreciation to Professor Mank for accepting uh, our invitation. And thank you very much, Professor Mank, for the fact that you are with us today in spite of this quite complicated situation. So thank you very much. And now I would like to ask prorector of our university, Professor Wojciech Sumelka, to say a few words. Mr. Rector, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Well, dear Professor Herbert Mank, uh, it's a really privilege and honor for us that you are in fact visiting us uh, for two days because also tomorrow we will see uh, your, I'm sure, perfect lecture. Let me say uh, warmly hello in Poland, in Poznań, and finally in Poznań University of Technology. Uh, we really would like to uh, you know, see you here and to govern together in a classroom, however, well, the situation is, as Chairman said, uh, you know, not so easy, but we are happy that you agree to be with us and you prepared uh, a lecture. Uh, let me also say that uh, personally, I had uh, a few possibilities to, to hear your lecture in Poland uh, during uh, Computer Methods in Mechanics Conference in, uh, in Zielona Góra or in uh, Lublin. So um, I'm sure that uh, you will also today open for us, uh, you know, new uh, subjects, uh, new interesting areas of study. So uh, one more time, warmly, thank you very much. And uh, Chairman, now I guess that you will introduce more deeply uh, our guest. Thank you. Let me now briefly introduce our, our lecturer, Professor Herbert Mank. And in few words, I can just say that Professor Mank is a world-renowned scientist and civil engineer with outstanding scientists and organizational achievements. He has, he has contributed a lot to the, to the development of science and international cooperation, especially in the field of civil engineering and computational methods. But honestly, having said that, I must admit that uh, to introduce, to, to present the, the achievements of Professor Manx is, um, is, a, is a task uh, which seems to be impossible. There are a lot, so many, so different uh, achievements and activities. So let me just concentrate on the headlines on just to, to highlight the, the, mo the most important, uh, I would say, points, and we working and being active in this area uh, understand what such, a, uh, such achievements mean 
what kind of uh, activity, what kind of work is behind this, uh, those activities. So uh, Professor Monk is, to start with, Professor Monk is affiliated with the Vienna University of Technology and since 1967, and actually his professional career is connected with this university with many leaves abroad. And uh, since 2010, he is Professor Emeritus there. But uh, also, parallelly, he is also affiliated with Tonji University since 2017, uh, 2012, and full professor there since 2017. So at uh, the Jena University of Technology, Professor uh, Monk uh, received his diploma, uh, diploma engineer, then doctor of technical sciences, I would translate in 1970. And four years later, uh, he made the second PhD now in Texas Tech University with major structural engineering and minor mathematics. And we can observe, studying his uh, papers, his works, this um, tendency to analyze, to formulate the engineering problems in terms of mathematics. And also his achievements in computational methods have uh, roots in uh, and in mathematics, I would say. Uh, also at Vienna University, he uh, received habilitation and um, served as head of institute, dean, prorector of the university. And also in Austria, uh, the important role in the realm of science was uh, uh, his function as secretary, general secretary of Austrian Academy of Sciences from 1995 to 2003, and then for the next four years as president of Austrian Academy of Sciences. He was also president of European Community for Computational Methods in Applied Sciences from 2005 to 2009. And uh, I mentioned that he spent uh, uh, some years abroad, it was the Fulbright. He was a Fulbright Fellow uh, at Texas Uni uh, Tech University and also it was 1971-73 and then 75-76 Carl Kate Fellow at Cornell University col uh, collaborating then with Professor Gallagher from, we know the name, from Finite Elements and also visited Tokyo University uh, where he collaborated, uh, has co-worked with Professor Vashizu. So his activity, even then, were uh, also outside, outside, uh, outside Wien, outside Vienna University. Uh, concerning scientific profile, let me mention that um, the area of research a campus, uh, a campus mechanics of deformable solids, structural mechanics, computational mechanics, especially uh, the stability of structures, including buckling, and as materials, it is concrete, rocks, and soil. And uh, recently, he focused also on the multi field analysis and multi scale analysis. So the fruits of his uh, scientific activities are 23 books, eight of them is co-authored, are co-edited, over 500 uh, scientific papers, over 500 scientific presentations, including 60 plenary lectures and 35 keynote lectures. And as it was mentioned already, Professor uh, Monk also visited Poland many times, and I will I will come to this point at my uh, at the end of my presentation, and uh, especially uh, he delivered lectures at the conference on computer uh, method in mechanics. He organized many uh, many uh, conferences, including fifth and sixth work, uh, world congresses on computational mechanics. 
He's a member of 20 academies of sciences, including, including the Chinese Academy of Engineering and US National Academy of Engineering and many, many others. And um, well, he's a member of the editorial boards uh, over 50 hundred journals. And here I would just like to emphasize the engineering structures journal where he plays the role of regional editor. Yes, and uh, his activity and scientific achievements are recognized and uh, widely and he's, uh, he received uh, Dr. Honoris Causa of six universities, including Kraków, Innsbruck, Kiev, Prague, Leuven, Vilnius. And uh, well, many, many scientific prizes, medals, decorations. Let me just cite a few. So Distinguished Engineer Award of the College of Engineering of Texas Tech University, Great Golden Decoration for Services of, to the Republic of Austria, Euler Medal of the European Community of Computational Methods in Applied Sciences, Newark uh, Medal of the American Society of Civil Engineers, many, many others. And coming to their relations to Poland, and uh, I must personally also say that I had the privilege to meet Professor uh, um, Monk some 30 years ago, and he was, uh, we had a long talk, and it was very inspirational for me. It was the time when I uh, spent some time in, uh, in Germany. So in Poland, Professor Monk enjoys very high recognition and respect for the results of his scientific uh, achievements, of his scientific activities, and also, and this is this I would, would also like to stress for the for his uh, uh, supporting activities for the development of science and scientists in Poland, and including also our uh, Polish. Association for Computational Mechanics. And um, in Poland, uh, Professor Monk is a member of the Polish Academy of Sciences since, since, 2000, since the year 2000. And he obtained, as I mentioned before, uh, the title of Dr. Honoris Causa of Krakow University of Technology and also the Medal uh, of the Polish Society of computer methods in mechanics, uh, Professor Olga Zienkiewicz medal. And he is also recipient of the order of the Republic of Poland. And as it is said in Poland, Professor Monk is a friend of Poland. So uh, this is just a very short summary of his attitude, his help for, for Poland and for Polish uh, scientists. So thank you very much once again, Professor Monk, that you are with us today. We are uh, looking forward to your uh, lecture, which will be interesting, we know. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Let me first say a few words of thanks to uh, Vice Rector Sumelka for the very nice welcome address. I would have certainly liked to give this lecture in presence in Poznan, but uh, I'm glad that it was possible to give it uh, in online. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to express my sincere thanks to Vice Dean Mechiswat Kuchma for his really <laughs> very flattering uh, description of uh, my curriculum vitae. Uh, he said far too much, uh, but he forgot one thing, and this is that my wife is Polish, and uh, it's true that I am, uh, how do you say in Polish, Piatiel Polski. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm coming now to my lecture. The title is given here, On a Remarkable Geometric 
a mechanical synergism based on a novel linear eigenvalue problem. And I would especially uh, acknowledge the cooperation with Dr. Michal Manendowski, who stayed with me for a whole year in Vienna. And if I talk about the novel linear eigenvalue problem, I want to stress that the idea for this eigenvalue problem I owe to Dr. Malendowski. He was playing around with the computer and made this suggestion, and I happily took it up. I would also give credit to Dr. Johannes Kalliauer, who came on board of my small team after Dr. Michał Malendowski returned to Poland. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor and pleasure to give this seminar at uh, the Faculty of Civil and Transport Engineering of Politechnica Bosnianska. I'm coming now to saying a few words about the contents of my lecture. I'll begin with a brief introduction. Then I'll introduce a novel linear eigenvalue problem. Uh, I've mentioned this before. Thereafter, I'll present results from a convergence studies concerning spatial and temporal discretization. I will explain later on the inverted commas in front and after the word temporal. The next part of my presentation is numerical verification of the asserted geometric mechanical synergism. The next uh, sub part of my presentation has the title numerical falsification of the hypothetically extended range of validity of the geometric mechanical synergy. At the end of my talk, I'll present a couple of conclusions, and this is enriched by a few comments on present and future work. The motivation for this research actually dates back maybe 10 or 15 years. But say, presently, uh, based on previous work, it is the investigation of the assumed geometric mechanical synergism represented by the formula in the yellow box. Well, on the left-hand side of the equation, rho sub 1 denotes the radius of curvature of a curve on the surface of an n-dimensional unit hypersphere. I'll explain later on the reason for the subscript 1. On the right-hand side, we have a ratio consisting of the different u minus um in the numerator and U in the denominator. U stands for the strain energy of a proportionally loaded structure. And UM denotes the stretching energy of beams, frames, and arches, or if you come to shells, it would be better to talk of the membrane energy. Ladies and gentlemen, the expression uh, for the geometric quantity on the left-hand side of this equation, on top of this slide, is given in the lower part of this slide. It contains the norm, the third power of the norm of the vector velocity of an eigenvector R1. I will come back to this later on. This eigenvector is a function of an arc length type parameter, which in turn depends on a dimensionless load parameter. The definition of the equation for xi is given at the lower end of the slide. In the integrand, you see the norm of a differential of the nodal displacement in the context of the finite element method. Now, uh, if, for example, uh, there is no concern about SNAP's rule, we can replace 
Psi bei Lambda. Uh, I said before, Lambda is a dimensional float parameter that dot denotes the der derivative with respect to the parameter, which, as I've said, can either be an arc length parameter or the length. Now, where from do we get the dqs here? Well, we get them from the incremental or differential equilibrium conditions in the context of the finite element metal, where kt denotes the tangent stiffness matrix, and q is a vector of work equivalent node displacements in the context of the finite element metal. Now, where from does the eigenvector R1 come? It comes from a linear eigenvalue problem involving the tangent stiffness matrix, which, as I've said before, depends on xi, which depends on lambda, and a matrix B, the second coefficient matrix. And this second coefficient matrix must be a constant, symmetric, positive definite matrix, which is to determine such that the first derivative at lambda is zero, that means the initial vector velocity is zero, the initial vector acceleration is zero, and all the higher derivatives uh, of R1 at lambda is zero, that means at the onset of, of loading are zero. And if this is indeed the case, then R1 is obviously a constant. So, the vector, the eigenvector at the onset of loading. This must be possible. Now let me explain the uh, subscript one. Well, the so-called relevant eigenpair consists of the relevant eigenvalue, C1, and the relevant eigenvector, R1. And this is uh, the null vector, C1 is zero, at the stability limit, a necessary and sufficient condition. It's well known that the tangent stiffness matrix times R1 is zero. That means that the tangent stiffness matrix is a positive semi-definite matrix. The list of literature is not very large, uh, I, because obviously it's only a small group, who has worked on that. I'm mentioning uh, former doctoral students, Stefan Pavlicek and Xin Jia from China. And there's another work uh, which was written by me uh, alone. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm coming now to Malendowski's linear eigenvalue problem. He proposed to set the second coefficient matrix equal to the initial tangent stiffness matrix. That means to the tangent stiffness matrix at the onset of loading, which is the well-known small displacement uh, matrix, as it's called, for example, by Professor Sienkiewicz. Kt0 is the tangent stiffness matrix at the onset of loading. So this is the form of the linear eigenvalue problem which Dr. Malindowski has subjected. The tangent stiffness matrix minus the eigenvalue times the initial tangent stiffness k is zero and the whole thing multiplied by the eigenvector. Now, let me specialize this equation for lambda is zero, equal to zero, in order to provide you with the rationale for this linear eigenvalue problem. Well, I specialize it uh, for lambda zero. That means I put here the subscript zero, C, then the eigenvalue at lambda zero, and so on. Now, obviously, for lambda zero, this matrix is equal to this matrix. I can, can combine the two. This gives kt zero times r1 zero. Since kt zero is a positive definite matrix, kt0 times r10 cannot be equal to zero. Consequently, this term here must be equal to zero, from which it follows 
that he i is at zero is one. Now i stretches over the n degrees of freedom of the finite element representation of the structure, and hence we have n eigenvalues. So at the beginning of loading, we have an n-fold eigenvalue that is equal to one. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the eigenvectors represent a complete basis. And this allows representation of an arbitrary vector in terms of the eigenvectors. In particular, I can express the vector velocity r1 dot in terms of the eigenvectors r2, r3, and so on up to rn. This is a finite series where the formula for the coefficient cij contains in the numerator a bilinear form involving the derivative of the tangent thickness matrix with respect to the parameter. In the numerator, we have a quadratic form, which cannot be zero, because B is assumed to be positive definite. And we have the difference of the j's and the first eigenvalue. Uh, so let us specialize this for lambda is zero. We have just learned before that he i zero is an n-fold eigenvalue. So they are all equal, kappa g, uh, uh, he g, j, he i, the two are equal one. Hence the numerator, the denominator of this term is zero. Since c one j zero must be finite, also the numerator must be zero. So we obtain an indeterminate expression and by applying the L'Hopital's rule, we obtain the expression shown at the lower end of the transparency. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we want to specialize this expression for R1 dot is equal to zero. As I've said before, it must be possible to solve problems where all the derivatives of Ri are at uh, R1 at lambda is zero is equal to zero. Now, for this special case, we obtain the equation that is given on top of the slide. And what we learn from this is that the eigenvectors are orthogonal with respect to k to zero, and we will see also with respect to the higher derivatives, the tangent fitness matrix. In order to show this, we differentiate the mathematical formulation of Malendowski's eigenvalue problem with respect to the chosen parameter. And this gives this relationship consisting of two terms. We specialize this for R1 dot is equal to zero. And this is what remains at lambda is zero. And we realize immediately that the eigenvectors are orthogonal, not only with respect to the tangent stiffness matrix, but also with respect to its derivative at lambda is zero. So we have two orthogonality relations here. Now we take this equation A here, this one, and differentiate it with respect to the chosen parameter. And this results in the equation B that now already contains three terms. We specialize this equation for lambda is zero. If we do this, the last term is automatically zero. And what we obtain is given on uh, the next slide. Let me come back. Uh, this term is automatically zero. Uh, we have found that R1 dot is equal to zero. So consequently, the first one must be equal to zero. And what do we learn from this? We learn from this that the eigenvectors are also orthogonal with respect to the second derivative of the tangent thickness matrix, 
at lambda is zero. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for the lambda is zero, R1 dot zero entails three orthogonality conditions involving the tangent stiffness matrix, its first derivative, and its second derivative, all at lambda is zero. Now, by analogy, we could keep on with this type of derivation. And we would find that uh, R1 dot zero is zero, R1 two dot zero is zero, and that these relations entail the orthogonality relations which are given here. So, the eigenvectors are orthogonal at lambda is zero to the tangent stiffness matrix, its first, second, third, and so on, with respect to all derivatives. Now, you may pose the question, what is the benefit of this? Well, let us assume we have alternatively chosen, instead of kt0, the unit matrix i. In this case, of course, we would have obtained other eigenvectors. This is why I have put an asterisk here. And we would have found that the eigenvectors, the new eigenvectors, are no longer uh, orthogonal with respect to the third, the fourth, and so on, the higher derivatives of the tangent stiffness matrix as lambda is equal to zero. Now I come to the key point of this lecture. It will be shown numerically that rho 1 is zero, a geometric quantity, correlates with pure stretching, and that rho 1 is 1 correlates with pure bending. Ladies and gentlemen, I am presenting now a couple of uh, results from conversion studies concerning the spatial and the temporal discretizations. What do I mean by this? Well, we solve uh, the linear eigenvalue problem kt minus p times b times r is zero, with a is, uh, with b is equal to kt zero, that's Malinowski's problem, and b is i, and with several finite elements. The finite elements used in the numerical investigation are listed in this table. Dr. Malendowski has used the uh, P and Bradford elements, approximately stands for an approximate representation of the strain tensor. Uh, the second element is P and Bradford accurate, that means the accurate representation of the strain tensor. The formulation in both cases is based on displacement and on the Euler-Bernoulli hypothesis. The third column contains the number of node points of the finite elements and uh, the form of the shape functions, cubic, quadratic, linear. In the last column, we have the number of degrees of freedom. Dr. Malindowski has also used a couple of abacus elements, and Dr. A, Dr. Kalliauer has used some additional ones. In this list, the big O stands for open section, and the capital H stands for hybrid. Hybrid means that we do not only have displacement, nodal degrees of freedom, but also force, uh, uh, force degrees nodal of freedom. Well, the problems we have solved are, of course, a very simple one. Let me show them briefly. One is a two-hinged parabolic arch subjected to a uniformly distributed vertical load. And the other one is a simple pure bending beam. Okay. Now, let me uh, turn to uh, the results obtained for spatial discretization. Spatial discretization simply means uh, the number of finite elements and the, more, more accurately, the number of degrees of freedom, related, of course, uh, to the number of finite elements. 
we it started with two elements and went up to 2,000 elements. What is computed is row one, the radius of curvature. Uh, I've given the formula for it at the beginning of my lecture. The left column refers here to the swap line arch, investigated with the element B32. The one in the middle, pure bending, B32, OS, open section, and the last one, B32, OSH, open section and hyperplane. Now let me comment on the swap line arch. Take a look at the results. Actually, they converge to the correct value of rho 1. The correct value of rho 1, since it's a thrust line arch, it's not accurate the thrust line arch. An accurate thrust line arch would have had to have three hinges. We only investigated an arch with two hinges, but the bending moments, if you carry out an analytical solution, are negligibly small. In any case, you see the largest errors we make are about half a percent. So we have convergence to the correct line. For pure bending, uh, take a look at uh, the element in the second column. We have convergence, but the convergence is one to a wrong value. I'm coming back to this later on. And coming to the third column, we see that for relatively small numbers of degrees of freedom, we have uh, very good results. Uh, there are some numerical problems when we get very large numbers of elements. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm coming now to temporal discretizations. What does this mean? Well, we have to compute the radius of curvature. And uh, it's actually the curve we are describing is one of an n-dimensional unit hypersphere. What does that mean? When I was a student, I, I learned about differential geometry in three dimensions. But here we are dealing with differential geometry in n-dimensions, because the finite element vectors, depend on the number of degrees of freedom, have n degrees of freedom. So, the sphere on which the curve, uh, whose curvature we are computing, is an n-dimensional unit hypersphere. And obviously, uh, we have to resort to uh, finite difference approximations of the first and the second derivative of R1. That means of the vector velocity and the vector acceleration. The uh, table here shows the median value of rho 1 for different te temporal discretization for Malendowski's uh, finite uh, linear eigenvalue problem. Uh, the, what you see here is the size of load step. And what you see in the first column are the results for the swap plan art, and in the second column, the results for pure bending. Ladies and gentlemen, we have also uh, computed, uh, carried out such a conversion study for the median value of kappa 2. What is kappa 2? Kappa 2 is a quantity that uh, occurs in the expression for the derivative of rho 1. So it means for the derivative of a curve that is located on an n-dimensional unit hypersphere. Uh, let me explain this expression. S1 point is uh, the speed of a fictitious, uh, of a fictitious mass point that is moving on the curve on this hypersphere. Now, kappa 2 is the second Frenet curvature. When I was a student, I only learned about three dimensions. And the second Frenet curvature in three dimensions is the so-called twist of the curve. Now it's a little bit more complicated. R1 times E3 is a scalar product involving the third vector of the Frenet frame. 
in three dimensions, you would talk of the binormal vector. What you see here is the size of the load step and the values of kappa 2, both for the soft line arc and pure bend. Now, let me comment on these results. Since kappa 2 is part of the expression for rho 1 dot, it is considerably more sensitive to the size of delta lambda than rho 1. For the thrust line arch, analyzed with element P32, the median value of kappa 2 is numerically stable for delta lambda larger or equal to half a percent, 0.005. For pure bending, the median value of kappa 2 is numerically stable for delta lambda is larger or equal to 0.002. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm coming now to numerical verification of the asserted geometric mechanical synergies. I begin with the verification for pure stretching of a two-hinged parabolic arch subjected to a uniformly distributed vertical load. Please take a look at the comment at the lower end of the slide. It says, the structure may approximately be considered as a thrust line arch. Uh, well, obviously, if it had three hinges, it would be a thrust line arch. So we have negligibly small bending moments. I've mentioned it before. Length is 6 meters, height is 2.4 meters. The line load is a proportional load with D bar as the reference. Uh, uh, load, the cross section is a rectangular one, the modulus of elasticity is given the value at the low end of the slide, and also the one of Poisson's ratio. Ladies and gentlemen, the numerical investigation was carried out with both B is KT0 and B is I, with 20 finite elements each. The previous convergence study has shown, and this was the reason why I have uh, uh, taken uh, this convergence study to show you before I come to presentation of the results, that sufficiently accurate results were obtained with 20 elements. Let's have a look at the first row. You see some quantities in green colors and some quantities in red colors. The one in green colors are assumed to be correct, approximately correct, of course, with some very small errors. The one in red colors are assumed to be incorrect. Uh, there are some comments say with one of the elements, the first three eigenvalues are constant threefold eigenvalues, leading to an indeterminate expression for row one. So sometimes, of course, we have to cope with such difficulties. In any case, for B is K is zero. This is uh, Dr. Mike Malendowski's problem. The hypothesis was verified for the first four out of the six elements considered. Conversely, for B is I, the hypothesis is verified just for the last two of these six elements. Uh, well, there is an advantage, obviously, of B is K is zero over B is I. Uh, the reason for this advantage, well, one of the reasons seems to be that we obtain, as I've said previously, an n-fold initial eigenvalue, kappa I zero is equal to one, representing a constraint, if you will, on the eigenvalue T I. Ladies and gentlemen, here I show graphs of the results. The row one, the radius of curvature, which according to the hypothesis is equal to u minus um over u as a function of the line load B. Obtain figure A with B is KTC, figure B with B is I, and with 20 abacus elements each. Now let's have a look at the left figure. 
apart from small deviations of rho 1 from 0, ranging from 0.011 to 0.17. 0.17 looks larger, but it's out of the range of, uh, say, normal consideration. Displacements are very large already there. B is KT0 provides the correct result. The upper bound, rho 1 is 0.70, refers to a load level well above the stability limit. The stability limit is shown here in the right figure by the vertical dark line. So these small deviations from zero are well above the stability limit where consideration of the primary load displacement part pass is physically meaningless actually. Well, uh, and you see also that B is I does not provide the correct result. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now come to the second example. Pure bending of a simply supported beam subjected to equal bending moment at both ends. In this case, a loss of stability of the beam occurs by flexural torsional buckling. We have a couple of uh, bending moments which are proportionally increased. The cross section is an IPE 400 and the value of the moment of inertia with respect to the axis Y, the modulus of elasticity and Poisson's ratio uh, are given here. Ladies and gentlemen, you might think this is a trivial example, but let me go back. Uh, let me actually go back and let's have a look at this formula on top of this slide here. The result I wish to obtain is rho is 1, independent of lambda. Because rho is 1 means that u minus u m over u, u m is 0, no member part of the energy, and you obtain 1. And it's not trivial uh, to get a numerator and a denominator, which is in the numerator, the third power of the norm of a vector velocity coming from a linear eigenvalue problem, that this term in the numerator is equal to the term in the denominator. So simple as this example may look like, it's definitely not a trivial situation. Let me just mention that loss of stability occurs here for the beam, by flexural torsional buckling. This slide contains the numerical results of the numerical investigation carried out again with the two uh, different versions for the second coefficient matrix, that is for B in the linear eigenvalue problem I presented at the beginning of my lecture. The previous conversion study again has shown that sufficiently accurate results were obtained with 20 elements. Uh, six elements uh, were considered, actually we considered more, but only six are shown in this table. Again, the two ones, Papi and Bradford, and four different abacus elements. The investigation was carried out both for KP0 and for R. And again, you see in the table green values and red values. The green ones refer to a uh, correct analysis. The result should be equal to one. And uh, uh, the red ones to incorrect one. Let me comment on this table. For B is KT0, the hypothesis is verified for the accurate PI and Bradford element and the abacus elements B32, O, SH, and B31, O, SH. The abacus element B32, O, SH is an extension of the abacus element B32, O, S, characterized by additional degrees of freedom to avoid volumetric locking uh, for materials with values of Poisson ratio larger than this number which we don't, we don't have to situation actually. This might be the reason 
for its success in a given case. A counter-argument, however, is the failure of the arbitrous element B3 or F, this one, for B is I. Let me show some graphs of the results. What you see here is the row 1 M Y diagrams obtained with left figure A is B is KT0 and B is I and with 20 abacus elements B32 OSH. Please take a look at the left figure. It shows the values of the first Rene curvature Rowan, which according to the hypothesis is equal to U minus UM over U. The vertical black line refers to the stability limit. And uh, the right figure refers uh, to the same analysis carried out with B equal to the unit matrix. And what we learn from this is that apart from small values of lambda, the results obtained with B is K to zero are very close to the correct result for those one. That is, uh, uh, as I've shown before, but B is I does not provide the correct result. Let me go back to the table. You see here a very close result, 0.9996, 0.9988, 9991, and so on. So very good approximation. Ladies and gentlemen, let us make a short excursion to the past when I cooperated with previous doctoral students Dr. Pavlicek and Dr. Child. There we worked uh, with another linear eigenvalue problem uh, characterized by setting the second coefficient matrix in the linear eigenvalue problem equal to the negative of the derivative of the tangent thickness matrix with respect to the chosen parameter, which in this case was equal to the dimension of those parameters. Now, however, P is a variable matrix. It's, of course, symmetric, but unfortunately, it is indefinite. Now, let us have a look at the diagram. The analysis refers to pure bending. So you would, would expect, actually, here, a horizontal line that, horizontal line that is equal Equal of, okay, horizontal line that is equal to one. You see, initially there's a small deviation of this line, of this line here from one, get a little bit larger. But then soon, when before coming to the stability limit, there's a sharp drop to zero. Zero means uh, a member stress rate which is obviously incorrect for a problem where you expect pure value. What is the reason for this? Well, uh, I've said before that the derivative of the eigenvector, that means the vector velocity, can be expressed in terms of the eigenvectors R2, R3, up to Rn. For this problem, the coefficient in this finite series is given like here. It contains the second derivative of the tangent fitness matrix with respect uh, to lambda. And it contains here the eigenvalue. Yeah? Now, the eigenvalue at the stability limit is, of course, zero. So, at lambda is lambda f, c1 is zero. This results in c1j is zero. This results in a vector velocity, which at the stability limit is equal to zero, and consequently in a radius of curvature that is equal to zero. What does this mean, radius of curvature that is equal to zero? The eigenvector doesn't move. Yeah? If it doesn't move here, it means that uh, its curvature tends to infinite, and the radius of curvature is the reciprocal value is equal to zero. So we obtain here at the stability limit a wrong result. Uh, instead of rho 1 is 1, 
we obtain UM is zero, the hypothesis fails. Well, this should illustrate, ladies and gentlemen, that it is important to find the correct eigenvalue problem. And as the numerical analysis have shown, it's also not trivial to find uh, correct elements because we require from the elements much more than is usually required in conventional final element analysis. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm coming now uh, to a part with the title Numerical Falsification of the Hypothetically Extended Range of Validity of the Geometric uh, Mechanical Synergism. And this title insinuates that this is part of ongoing research, trying to verify the extended range of validity of the hypothesis. Now, we are now considering a variable ratio u minus um over u. Before, we had a constant ratio, pure bending or pure membrane testing. Uh, consequently, according to the hypothesis, Rho 1 is a variable quantity. The formula for the derivative of Rho 1 dot was introduced before. It contains the speed of a fictitious particle moving on the surface curve on the surface of an n-dimensional unit hypersphere. Kappa 2 is the second Rene curvature. I'll explain this later on. Keep in mind, when you think about three dimensions, this would be equal to the twist. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let us have a look at this formula. You will see here that the derivatives are primes, actually. Uh, this primes means that we are dealing now with derivatives with respect to the arc lengths, uh, the S1. Kappa 2 is the second Frenet curvature, and E3 is the third vector of the Frenet frame. That means uh, the so-called binormal vector in 3D. Now here on this slide, you see here the expressions for R1 prime occurring here, R1 2 prime occurring here, R1 3 prime occurring here. The expressions for S1 2 dots which is part of this expression and part of this expression, and the expression for S13 dots, which occurs here. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what does this show? It shows that uh, we also need a finite difference expression for the third derivative of the eigenvector with respect to the parameter. And this form, central finite difference, is given at the lower end of the transparency. Um, now let me explain something which I've indicated already previously. When I was a student at the Vienna Polytechnic Institute in the early 60s, all I learned about the differential geometry of Rene formula were the ones in three dimensions, relating the tangents as made tangent uh, the uh, unit tangent to the curve, the normal vector and the binormal vector, all three functions of the arc length relating to the derivative with respect to the arc length. And if you take a look at this formula, you see that the matrix mapping T, N, and B onto T prime, N prime, and B prime is skew symmetric. Kappa is the curvature, and tau is the twist. Kappa can only be positive, but tau can have both sides. So we talk about a right round screw or a left round screw. Now, unfortunately, our situation is not so easy. We are working with Frenet formula in n dimensions, and the respective formula are given here. We are relating uh, uh, the n unit vectors E1, E2 up to En to their derivatives with respect to S. And you see here actually the skew symmetric uh, character of the matrix is maintained 
if we extend this formula from 3D to ND, uh, all the kappa 1, kappa 2, kappa 3, uh, up to kappa n minus 2 are positive real quantities. The exception is tau. Uh, tau is the torsion, the last one here, which can be positive or negative. I've given here a reference on the fundamental theory for curves in the n-dimensional Euclidean space. Ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, analyzed uh, a simple example, where it's actually not so simple, a bar subjected to eccentric compression. Uh, the length is given here. It is uh, five, uh, length is five meters. The reference load is one. It's an IPE 400 that was investigated. Re uh, the area of uh, this cross section and uh, the moment of inertia and the values for E and B. And then you see here a very odd number. The eccentricity is 40,4 for 7 times 10 to the minus 3. How about that? Well, if you investigate this example, by means of theory of third order. That means uh, without linearization of the curvature. Yes. Uh, uh, that means uh, uh, in, then uh, it's a relatively complicated problem for which there is no analytical solution. There is, of course, an analytical solution for the two-dimensional, uh, sorry, for uh, uh, simplified. Uh, theory if you linearize the expression for the curvature. Uh, now, uh, fortunately, for lambda is zero, theory of second order provides the correct solution. So we chose E such that for lambda is zero, we obtain 0 0.5. Now you might argue, what sense does it make to compute this quantity for lambda is zero? If there's no load, there's no bending energy, bending energy zero, membrane energy zero. However, uh, you can show very easily that for u minus um over u at lambda is zero, for which ub over um is equal to one, you get an expression that is independent of the actual force. You get a simple expression E squared A over IT. And as you can see, we didn't succeed in getting the correct result. Take a look at the table here. The values uh, are much smaller. The best ones are for B3OS. Let me show you now some graphs of the result. Uh, the two upper ones show the radius of the first Brené curvature as a function of the applied force B for Malendowski's problem and for B is I. If you take a close look at these two figures and the two ones below, which shows the dependence of the scalar product R1 times E1 on the applied force, you will realize that the extreme values coincide with the null values of the second diagram. This follows from the formula which I've presented before. From this formula follows, okay? Uh, rho 1 dot is 0, where R1 E3 is equal to 0. And this result we really obtained. So rho 1 p is a non-monotonic function. And actually, it should be a non-monotonic function. In the beginning, say, membrane energy is dominating. And then bending energy becomes more and more prominent until a peak value of this ratio u minus m over u is, is reached. Well, the non-monotony of rho 1 p corresponds to the expected non-monotony of u minus um over u. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to the conclusion. Basically, rho 1 is a reasonable geometric quantity 
for a hypothesis concerning a geometric mechanical synergism involving u minus um over u because first the expression for rho one given here normalized with r one equal to one and u minus um over u they have the same bounds obviously the bounds of u minus um over u are zero and one and the bounds of any curve on a unit n dimensional unit hypersphere of the radius of curvature are also zero and one. Zero for a, uh, for a situation where the vector doesn't move and one for a situation where uh, the curve is a so-called great circle, the radius of which is one. Rho 1 is independent of the parameter chosen for its computation. I mean, this is obviously necessary, because otherwise the results wouldn't be objective. Uh, selected, end of the selected non-rotating global Cartesian system of reference used for computation of the global stiffness matrix by the finite element method. Now, the designation remarkable in the title of this lecture of the linear eigenvalue problem kt minus k times kt zero times r equal to zero is justified insofar as it results in an n-fold eigenvalue equal to one at lambda zero. Moreover, the orthogonality conditions are j times k sigma plus ku r1 is zero, where k sigma is the initial stress matrix and ku is the initial displacement matrix, these uh, orthogonality conditions, they disintegrate for pure bending. For pure bending, k sigma is equal to zero. So if this term is equal to zero, then the eigenvectors are obviously orthogonal with respect to KU. And the same uh, applies to a linear stability problem where KT is proportional to uh, the derivative of K sigma at lambda is zero and KU is zero. Now, if KU is zero, of course, this also disintegrates representing a special case of pure fetching. Think of the Isla beams. For the Isla beams, this situation would hold. Now, this gives rise to the supposition that the disintegration of the above orthogonality conditions into this bilinear form and this bilinear form correlates with u minus um over u. Uh, so far, we didn't show this. It's not so trivial because it requires that uh, we can isolate in uh, the tangent stiffness program, tangent stiffness matrix, we can isolate k sigma and ku. Keep in mind, these are commercial programs. So it's not so trivial to carry out this isolation. Now, according to uh, the hypothesis, this disintegration correlates with the one of this equation, which I had before, into the following terms. Kappa 1 prime is zero. That is the derivative with respect to the outlines. The second Frenet curvature related somewhere to the twist equal to zero. And this equation, which simply shows that the third derivative of the unit vector is collinear with the first derivative, the vector velocity. And the proportional factor is simply the radius of curvature. From this, it follows that rho 1 is equal to 1 divided by the norm of the third derivative of the eigenvector. Obviously, rho 1 is equal for general situation as uh, the reciprocal value of the norm of the second curvature. That's the classical definition of uh, the curvature and its reciprocal value. So, for rho is constant, we obtain the solution that the norm of 
the second derivative of uh, the unit of the matrix R1 is equal to the norm of the third derivative. Now, the validity of the hypothetically asserted geometric mechanical synergism for a variable ratio of u minus m over u could not be verified for the example of a bar subjected to eccentric compression. Qualitatively, however, the expected uh, non-monotony of the row 1p diagram reflected the non-monotony of u minus m over u. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, what are we presently doing? We are presently searching for possible reasons of incorrect results. The first suspicion is that the eigenvalue phi1, which is the basis for computation of rho1, depends on the chosen finite element, with the exception of the onset of loading, where this one, Malandowski's problem, and at the stability limit, where it is zero. Uh, take a look at the left figure. It shows uh, the eigenvalue for two different finite elements. Uh, and you see that actually both elements uh, yield the same result. It's practically a straight line. Now go to the right hand side, the figure on the right hand side. It refers to being subjected to pure bending. And you see that for the hybrid element, we obtain a straight line here, the red dashed curved line. And for uh, the other element, we obtain a slightly curved situation. Well, uh, this fact actually uh, doesn't rule out that everything is basically correct. Uh, because since P1 depends on the chosen finite element, R1 depends on it. However, we are not computing R1, we are computing rho, and rho contains the first uh, vector velocity and the second and the vector acceleration. So even if there are differences between the eigenvalues, uh, the correct quantity of rho1 may still be obtained. Uh, let me pose a question. Does the dependence of R1 on the chosen finite element, actually I have answered it already partially, a priori preclude the general validity of the hypothesis provided R sub 1 is a mechanically objective quantity question? Okay, we normalize R1 such that its length is 1. Obviously, then the derivative of this expression shows that R1 and R1 dot are orthogonal. We take the second derivative and take into account that uh, the length of the eigenvectors, if the argument is chosen as the parameter, is equal to 1. And this gives them R1 times R1, 2 times is minus 1. And we carry on with all that until we finally find out that rho 1 is 1 over the norm of uh, absolute value of the second derivative of the curvature, and this is equal to minus cotine t. What does it mean? Uh, if you normalize the eigenvector such that its length is 1, then the cosine of this angle is equal to the negative of the length uh, of this vector. So, on the assumption of the general validity of the hypothesis, uh, rho 1 is u minus um over u, rho 1 is minus cosine phi is independent of the chosen finite. However, there is another problem. The eigenvector r1 is not a physical vector, it's a mathematical vector. It contains components of different dimensions. Hence, uh, there may be problems with the conventional normalizations of R1. And uh, this is uh, maybe the thrust of our present research to look for an alternative objective normalization. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much, Professor Monk, for the very insightful and, I believe, inspiring lecture. It was clearly presented and we could learn how uh, initially simple problems, how difficult they, they be and what uh, is actually hidden in them. So thank you very much. And now it's time for asking questions or expressing comments. Uh, you can write them in the chat box or you can just ask directly using your microphone. So I just uh, invite and encourage to ask questions. Don't see to now. So if I may ask, uh, I mean, uh, we can observe, uh, we could observe that the final results depend on the finite elements used. I mean, we are all aware that finite element method is an approximation method, but here this, uh, uh, the, I mean, some calculations and some operations on the, the results resulted in, a, I would say, in a very drastic differences. And uh, it is, a, well, we, we, we would not expect such differences normally, but the problem has many sub, uh, is very subtle. And that's why I think this, differences uh, have appeared. Okay, uh, let me comment on that. Normally in finite elements uh, stability analysis, what you compute is uh, an eigenvalue and an eigenvector. Uh, and you know, finite element methods have certain continuity conditions at element ages and so on. Uh, now here, we're going to derivatives of eigenvectors, first and second derivatives. And uh, uh, say this, uh, this requires probably more conditions to be satisfied than is normally done in finite element analysis. In bending analysis, what you have, you have simply to deal with kt times dq is the lambda left time p bar. The linear eigenvalue problem is uh, kt minus something times r1 is zero. But here you have, uh, you get this eigenvector and this eigenvector is then differentiated. Now the problem can be uh, if you have a purely mathematical eigenvector. Yeah? You don't care about the dimensions of the components of this eigenvector which you are normalizing. But if you have, say, a finite element eigenvector, uh, you uh, may have a problem. If you normalize it, like, say, in dynamic analysis, you take the eigenvector R1 times the the mass matrix like R1. R1 doesn't have to be dimensionally correct, but the, the uh, say, bilinear form, yes, quadratic form R1 n times R1 is objective. Now here, you have an eigenvector, and this eigenvector, depending on the finite element, you may have degrees of freedom which have the length n. Then you may have slopes at nodal decays of freedom, which have the, the dimension zero. Now you, what you do, you take uh, the square root, uh, you take the square root of the sum of the squares. And uh, you have to be very careful, say, about objectivity of uh, the quantity you're computing. And my feeling is that actually the finite element as such uh, is part of the problem. Of course, if we could deal with finite elements which have only nodal decays of freedom, we should have no problem. But if we are dealing with finite elements for beams or shells, arches, with, say, 
uh, components of different dimensions. If we square them and take the sum of the squares, the square root, he may have a problem. Uh, and uh, we don't have this problem normally in dynamic analysis because in dynamic analysis, we normalize the eigenvectors with respect to the mass matrix, for example, R1 times M times R1. And this is set is equal to 1. And even if, say, the components of R1 have different dimensions, uh, say, the uh, quadratic form R1 times M times R1 is okay. So, uh, uh, there, are, there are two reasons for problems. The problem is, uh, they have to do sorry, with higher derivatives of quantities, which are normally not computed in finite element analysis. And secondly, the question of objectivity of the normalization of the eigenvectors. I think this is, this is a, a fair answer to your question. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions uh, maybe from the audience? I, let me just have a look, I don't see. There is not the case, so let me say, oh, there is a question, please. Yes, sorry. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, professor, maybe could you comment, uh, can we generalize those results for other structural theories? Because uh, here we mainly discussed the uh, beam uh, kind of beam theories, but this is a very special kind of uh, uh, formulation. So, could you comment on some generalizations? Yes, uh, yes, I can. Actually, the hypothesis should hold for any one or two dimensional type of structure and combinations of two. Say, you could have a shell and you could have some beams supporting the shell. One or two dimensional structures wherever it makes sense to define uh, a membrane energy and the bending energy. Yeah? Wherever the, of course, for 3D, it makes no sense because you cannot distinguish between the two. And maybe I didn't clearly say what the technical background is about. Uh, when you design a structure, you would hope that most of the load is carried by stretching, stretching in beams or in shells by membrane action. Normally, there are some exceptions. So uh, you could, for example, uh, if somebody asks you how much bending is in this structure, well, you can say, depends of course on the load, there's a lot, there's little. If it's a truss, you can say theoretically there should be nothing. Uh, if it's a thrust line out with three hinges, you could say theoretically it should be nothing. But you couldn't say how much it is. And here, if everything works, you can say, okay, uh, I can predict the percentage of bending energy, and energy is a reasonable quantity, for any load level. And clearly, uh, it must function for the simplest case. But the simplest cases are those where, for, where you have an analytical solution. Normally, you don't have it. Yeah? And uh, even, say, for the eccentric beam, there's no solution for what we call in German theory, dritter order, theory of third order. Uh, and fortunately, for lambda is zero, theory of second order. So uh, uh, the answer to uh, your question is, yes, uh, it should be independent, uh, the, the hypothesis, if it works, it should work for any combination of one and two dimensional structures, and it's also independent, say, of material properties such as this, yeah? Um, this is, say, my, my hope. Uh, I have been working on that uh, with mixed success, to be fair, for many years. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, are there any further questions or comments? I would like to refer once again to uh, the question of uh, Professor Malendowski. Yes, 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 uh, please. Because you ask about the sensitivity of the results uh, 
for different finite elements. And as far as I remember, uh, in terms of internal forces and displacement, and there was uh, no sensi sensitivity. They c cannot be. So the yeah. displacement field and internal forces field uh, was completely the same uh, with no respect to the finite element. The problems begins uh, uh, when we compute the another quantities, as Professor Monk explained. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. I think... Uh, the problem started uh, with the eigenvalue analysis. And I recall we had discussions with Dr. Uh, Malandowski in this respect. Uh, uh, he got exactly the same result, the same Dr. Kalia, uh, uh, exactly the same results. But then, say, with uh, uh, the eigenvectors, it became difficult. And we made interesting analysis. We analyze the beams with different dimensions. They take in kilometers, meters, centimeters, millimeters. And of course, if you now take the norm, the quantities uh, in finite element analysis that have the dimension of an angle, yeah, they are not changed. But the, quant uh, the uh, terms which are associated with the lens, Yes, uh, they take, take the finite element normal degrees of freedom. They, they can be, say, displacements, they can be slopes. Uh, usually, if you take, say, a cubic element, you have the displacement at the both ends and the slopes at both ends. Now, if you change the dimensions uh, and uh, of the length element, uh, length degrees of freedom, corresponding to length dimension eigenvalues, eigenvectors, uh, and leave the ones uh, that uh, correspond to slopes, yes, then you have a problem. There are some methods uh, you would have to find, uh, how to say, the German word would be Naturkonstante, natural constants. But this is involved. <laughs> we are thinking about it now and finding a way that guarantees the objectivity of the eigenvector. This is, as I said, it's not a problem when you carry out, say, dynamic analysis minus omega squared times m plus q plus k times the eigenvector. You normalize with respect uh, to one. You say R times M times R is 1. And even if the R's are inconsistent, the whole quadratic form makes it consistent. But here you take the eigenvector, which uh, is, uh, say, may have a physical problem with different dimensions of the various components. And uh, this, I mean, it uh, this seems to be a matter of concern. Does this, does this, uh, is, is this answer reasonable? Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, I think that there are no more questions. So, uh, closing, I would like to, to, to point out uh, three. Points. The first, uh, let me say a big thank you for Professor Monk for the excellent lecture and for the discussion, for the explanation and for the question asked. Uh, I would like to thank also all the participants for attending the seminar. And finally, let, uh, let me remind and invite you to the second lecture to be delivered by Professor Monk tomorrow at 11 a.m. The title is, uh, let me just, the, the, Hong Kong, the, the lecture will be about the Hong Kong Suhai Macau Bridge. It, is, it will be an open lecture, I mean, organized uh, in cooperation, organized by Pol Politechnica Poznańska in cooperation with the city of Poznań. Uh, and uh, so it will be, I would say, 
a little bit easier to follow because this is a really mathematical uh, stuff which was presented by Professor Mann today. But I also know that uh, uh, the tomorrow's lecture will also include some uh, scientific aspects and considerations. So it will be a mix of both, if, if I may say so. So uh, please feel invited uh, to, to the lecture tomorrow. And uh, now I will just say, see you tomorrow. And now I wish you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. And see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow.